Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Leading Ideas Talks is also brought to you by the book Sustaining While Disrupting, The Challenge of Congregational Innovation. Authors Douglas Poe and Lovett Weems offer church leaders insights on practical skills for two crucial tasks. First, to sustain and strengthen foundational elements of the churches they serve. And second, to guide the critical innovation required to address a context vastly different from the one that current assumptions and behaviors fit. Learn more and order now at churchleadership.com slash books. And remember, to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information, please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. What if congregational change didn't focus on setting goals or planning new programs? Dwight Shiley believes finding a faithful way forward involves discovering what God is already doing in the lives of your neighbors and then finding way of joining in God's action. He shares a simple three-step process for experimenting with new practices that allow you to listen to God and your community. I'm Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary. I'm one of the editors of Leading Ideas e-newsletter, and I am so pleased to be the host of this episode of Leading Ideas Talks. Uh, I have the joy today of welcoming my friend Dwight Shiley from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he serves as a professor of congregational mission and leadership and also as vice president of innovation. Dwight and two colleagues, Michael Binder and Tessa Pinkstaff, have recently published a new book, Leading Faithful Innovation, Following God into a Hopeful Future. And that's the subject of our conversation today. It's good to see you, Dwight. Great to see you, Anne. It's good to be uh, on this podcast. Yeah. So I want to begin uh, with that phrase, Leading Faithful Innovation, that's in the title of your book. I wondered if you could just define those two key terms. Uh, what does the word innovation mean in, in your way of thinking? And what does the word faithful mean within the context of the work that you're doing? Yeah, so it's, in our case, it's really important that these words belong together because the word innovation can be very misleading. We see a lot of uh, uses of that word, even in the church today, that I think are less than helpful. Um, we define innovation really borrowing a definition from um, the work of some scholars, Denning and Dunham, which is basically the innovation is the adoption of a new practice in a community. And often for Christian communities, that is actually an ancient practice that has been uh, lost along the way that needs to be rediscovered. And faithful is really important in this sense in that what we are doing is not simply thinking about invention of starting something brand new, but the kind of faithful adaptation of the Christian faith and Christian life and church life that the church has always done over the years when it has um, been in incarnationally present in times of changing culture. And we certainly see ourselves facing today massive cultural changes. So I'm trained as a, as a scholar of mission, a missiologist. And one of the ways we think about that in the world of mission is just contextualization or incarnational adaptation of the church in, um, in changing circumstances. And so faithful innovation is that. And in our case, it's really um, about learning to follow God when the outcomes and the destination aren't clear ahead of time. Yeah, so related to that, one of the themes that really underlies the whole book is the idea that we need to shift our focus from the church and asking church questions to God and asking God questions. So I wondered if you could explain what you mean by that as well. Exactly. So, you know, the book is in some ways just an extended meditation on a particular passage of scripture. It's from the book of Acts chapter 16, um, verses 6 through 15. And, and you may recall this story where, you know, Paul and his companions feel called by God to share the gospel. And in this case, um, they have some ideas about the people to, with whom they're, they're called to share the gospel. So they start out on a journey and they end up actually being redirected and prevented by the Holy Spirit uh, 
from, you know, uh, actually connecting with a whole bunch of people in a bunch of regions. And they ha Paul has this vision of a man of Macedonia saying, come on over and help us. And so they make their way to Macedonia. And when they get there, they discover that it's not actually a man that they are being called or led to. It's actually a woman named Lydia. And they find Lydia outside you know, the gates of the city at a place of prayer bound by the river. And she receives the message in the first church there. She's actually the first European convert to Christianity. The first church in Philippi is started, which she then leads. And so it's a, it's a wonderful story of, um, of both knowing that you're being called by God in, into to connection with neighbors but not knowing exactly where or how. And so the process of faithful innovation is really about learning to follow God. And if you read through that text, like the rest of the book of Acts, God is the acting subject of so many verbs. You know, we live in the U.S. and Western societies in a culture that tends to seek the good without God. And uh, through its secularization tends to fall back on what can we do to fix the church? So we borrowed that uh, wonderful uh, language from Al Roxborough of um, shifting from asking church questions of things like, how do we get more people to join our church? Or, you know, how can we do church better? And those aren't bad questions. But if we don't ask them um, without really paying attention to God's leading, they end up being dead ends. So mm -hmm. asking God questions shifts the conversation it puts discernment back at the heart of the work because it's really how do we follow God and the agency of God um, to the destinations that God's leading us, again, when it's not so clear ahead of time. So, you know, often innovation can be understood as leaders develop a plan, a strategic plan, and we're going to manage everyone into that. And that's not at all what we're talking about in this book. Right. Now, I often think of the book of Acts as like a case study in spirit-led adaptive change and, you know, this idea that you, they didn't, didn't know, you know where, where they were headed, I think is a helpful metaphor for our day. Um, you describe um, what, I, what I think in many ways is a simple um, three-step model of change that's listen, act, and share. And um, our time is brief, uh, but I wanted to invite you to just you know, very briefly walk us through this model and explain some of the key elements of those three steps. So um, if we can begin with step one, listen. Yeah, so, um, you know, listening is so important. Um, in, our, in the case of this process, it's beginning with listening to God and listening to God together in community through scripture. So we have a series of simple practices that we discuss in the book that are really designed to build our capacity to pay attention to God. So for congregations taking this journey, it meant, means um, beginning with an initial practice called dwelling in the word, which is a simple way of listening to scripture and community rooted in ancient traditions of the church. And, um, and that, um, that also then leads to listening to each other's spiritual stories within the congregation, which is something that, you know, in many churches doesn't actually happen. Right. Um, and so we find that as we begin to, to listen more deeply, even just as simply in pairs and, you know, a prompt, like share a story of a time when you felt spiritually alive, energized or engaged, you know, th those kinds of simple prompts open up our capacity to actually name God's activity in our lives. And simple things like neighborhood walks, where we're paying mm -hmm. spiritual attention. Um, all of that listening capacity then helps us actually be able to listen to God and listen to our neighbors, or we talk about in the book, the Lydia's in our world, the Lydia's are those who are spiritually curious, but institutionally disconnected from religious institutions. Um, and so listen is really basic. If we don't know how to listen, any experiments we might want to do or any change we might want to do um, won't get us very far. Yeah. So then step two is act, but I think it's act in a different way than churches often think about, because often I think when churches think about taking action, they're thinking about, you know, um, instituting a new program or a plan. But when you talk about act, you're talking about action learning experiments. So uh, what does that mean? And, and maybe could you give a little bit of example of what that involves? So in the book, we talk about behaving our way into new ways of thinking and believing. And so you do that through simple action 
uh, experiments, uh, action learning experiments that we reflect upon. And these experiments are just new behaviors that um, are we recommend being very small and inexpensive, either like no budget or very low budget that have to do with investing presence and relationship in neighborhood spaces to join with what God's doing in those spaces or to, to, to meet the Lydia's, if you will, of, of, our, of our neighborhoods. And so um, these could be very simple things. I mean, an example that, um, you know, one church developed in Chattanooga, Tennessee was just putting out a table with some strips of cloth and inviting their neighbors to write prayers on the strips of cloth. And then they put them up on a, on a construction fence that was there. And they found that neighbors were really eager actually to share their prayers. They could pray actually with someone from the church if they wanted, but they could also just quietly write, you know, write their own um, prayer and hang it up. And, and as the church did this over time, they ended up collecting again, you know, hundreds literally of the, of the prayers of their neighbors, which they were able not only to pray over, but also to learn, you know, what their neighbors were yearning for and struggling with. And then, do more experiments out of that. Um, again, the experiment was simply, let's set up a table, you know, during a town festival, bring some strips of cloth and some markers, be present and invite our neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of stories in the book of very simple experiments like that, that open up deeper connections with neighbors, but they don't cost a lot. It's not about starting a new ministry, quote unquote, or mm -hmm. um, launching a program or, and, and they're not staff driven either. They're not clergy driven. These are lay led, um, you know, grassroots experiments that are intentionally not designed to be institutionalized in the sense of they require a lot of institutional maintenance. Mm -hmm. And then step three is share. Uh, and I, so um, can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, so share is the reflection part of the action mm -hmm. learning. It's where we we gather after the experiment and we say, well, how did that go? What did we learn? Um, what went well? What could we do differently next time? What might, wh where was their life-giving energy or connections with our neighbors? Because that might be an invitation from God for the next step. So the share is in, on the one hand, just simply the community, whoever's been involved in the exper experiments, gathering together reflecting on what they learned, but it also has another dimension, which is the sharing of those stories within the life of the Christian community or the congregation. Typically, this experimentation work is done by small teams of people, and um, if they only stay with the small teams and not with the larger congregation, it does the change doesn't go very far, and the congregation doesn't learn with those experimenters, and so it's very important that they become public story sharing uh, and reflection processes where the community begins to learn and interpret how God is actually leading them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I thought you made a really valuable point in the book where you say that, yes, this, this work will begin with a small group of people, and that's okay, because that's how change happens. Um, yeah. Yes, exactly. So it's so important to start small and on the side. And mm -hmm. we say, you know, for instance, don't focus your experimentation on your primary worship service. <laughs> you know, yeah. leave that as it is, but experiment on the edges where mm -hmm. the stakes for, um, you know, for quote unquote failure are much lower. And, you know, in our, our view, there's, only, there's no such thing as failure as long as you learn from whatever happens. There's mm -hmm. only feedback, as Michael Moyna says. So there's no such thing as failure, only feedback. So, um the approach to innovation that you're describing, uh, as I understand it, grew out of work that you and your colleagues have undertaken over many years with hundreds of local congregations. And so I wondered if you could just briefly describe that field work that uh, you drew on in writing this book, and then maybe give an example of how a congregation has successfully engaged this type of innovation. Yeah, so it does go back for, for many years. We had a, um, a Lilly grant, a thriving in ministry grant, where we were able to work with 50 uh, ELCA Lutheran congregations um, over mm -hmm. a four-year period, uh, working through this process. Uh, my colleague, Michael Binder, my co-author, actually worked with Presbyterians in Ohio and did his dissertation research on a version of this kind of process. And, um, you know, I've worked with Episcopalians. We've worked with lots of different groups. Um, over the years and trained a lot of leaders in it. And 
Um, so there's there's a lot of stories, um, you know, I could I could share. Um, but uh, but, you know, a, a, a couple ones that are that are quick here. I mean, so one example would be um, in Wisconsin, you know, a, um, a very rural congregation that when they were asked to do the neighborhood walk, they just kind of looked around and all that's around their church is cornfields, you know, and farm fields. So they, um, what they realized is they didn't actually know the, the farmers who were actually around their church building. So they did a simple experiment of taking some, some bag lunches to these farms and just approaching and asking the farmers if they could, um, you know, offer them the, the lunch and then just pray in Thanksgiving for the fact that these farmers were feeding the world. And they had no idea whether the farmers would throw them off the property or what would happen. And it turns out the farmers were really honored by this. And so their next experiment was to go to the grain elevator when the farmers were bringing in the crop at harvest time. And they set up a table. And, and again, these were some, some elderly, you know, Lutheran ladies who had never prayed a lot with anyone in their lives. And they found themselves there as the farmers were coming in you know, praying with them in Thanksgiving uh, for the harvest. And the farmers said, well, you need to come out now and pray over our fields in the spring when we're sowing. And it developed this deeper connection over time. And um, and so, you know, again, simple, simple practices. Um, you know, another uh, group of um, uh, what's in the Lutheran congregation called Women of the ELCA, the Welka group, which is sort of the ladies, mm -hmm. you know, auxiliary guild, which which was mostly, you know, um, more mature ladies and had a hard time getting younger women to join. And one of their experiments um, was, you know, they, they began with the church question, which was, how do we get younger women to join our Walka group? And they kept being frustrated about that. And then they reframed it to a God question, which was, what might God be up to in the lives of the younger families, particularly the younger women? And then how might we join in? And so, so their experiment was to begin to actually listen to the younger women and ask, they asked them, well, so what are the times that you find particularly spiritual meaning, spiritually meaningful in your families? And they learned that that was in mealtime and it was also at bedtime when they were putting their children to sleep. So their experiment was to develop some resources for the families to actually have um, you know, simple prayer and spiritual conversations at mealtimes. And then they created um, prayer bears, which were these be teddy bears that they sewed pockets on. And they made these little prayers that the children could sort of pull out at bedtime mm -hmm. and mom or dad could read to them. And, um, and it became this whole, again, this whole way to, to go from frustration people won't join our group to joining into where God mm -hmm. was actually active already in the lives of those families. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. I really appreciated that in the book, but too. Um, you know, you mentioned a minute ago the idea that these experiments are happening on the peripheral edges of the church, uh, intended to be largely lay led. Um, I think the book does envision or perhaps maybe names a, a changing paradigm of leadership in the church. Um, you talk about the idea of everyday disciples uh, being at the forefront of engaging neighbors in this process of listening, acting, and sharing. Um, and so I, I'm wondering then, you know, what is the role of a clergy leader uh, in this three-step innovation process? Yeah, so in the book we talk about a you know a paradigm shift that um, we think the church should should be making from what we talk about as a performative model of ministry, mm -hmm. which we've inherited. In many ways, it goes along with the kind of voluntary association model of congregation, which has been predominant in the last couple hundred years in American society, and with that, a professional model of ministry where, um, where again, theological knowledge kind of gets. Um, specialized and, and professionalized in the hands of, of uh, the experts of clergy and other formally trained leaders. And so thus the result then is that the expectation is people expect clergy to perform the faith for people, you know, to be the ones to pray, to read the Bible, to do the evangelizing, you bring the people into our church. Right. <laughs> um, and, and there's a kind of social contract, I think, in many congregations where what's expected actually of what we call everyday disciples or just lay people or regular members of the congregation is primarily to support the congregation institutionally, um, you know, through committee service and prayers and things like that. 
and giving rather than actually to um, grow as mature disciples who can live out their faith in daily life. And so this process is a way to shift that. And the role of clergy here is to walk alongside, to encourage, to give permission, to ask theological questions, and to equip people for this work. And so what we, we talk about it is almost like serving as a group spiritual director. Director, If you're a clergy person, it's wondering with the community, well, where do you see God active in these experiments? Or how might God be leading us? Um, but not to be the one who has to manage it, manage the process, or do it all herself or himself. Mm -hmm. And that's because our experience is that most clergy that we know right now are pretty depleted and already have more than enough to do, and they don't need one more thing on their on their plate. Um, but they are trained theologically and have that that great you know knowledge of the tradition to be able to ask good God questions and to help the community faithfully answer those in light of scripture and tradition and its experience. Yeah, well, I certainly appreciate your emphasis on, on lay leadership in, in this approach. And I, I think maybe in the book, you talked about how uh, the leader uh, of this process, I guess well, it could be a clergy or a lay person, one of the tasks of the leader is to really um, serve as an interpreter of what the experience is and what these different listening exercises and sharing, how creating a narrative around, around what that means, and but also being a cheerleader because you know this this can be really hard, right? It can be. And so that's so important for leaders to really create a space where um, where it's possible for folks to take this journey to try on the practices, not to get it right every time. Um, to, you know, be able to make mistakes without being shamed or, you know, be in, in fear. And so that's really a spiritual and theological kind of atmosphere or environment is, you know, if you will, that, um, that those leaders need to create for this to actually happen. And I, you know, I've seen it so powerfully when, um, when leaders make that shift, where they realize they don't need to do it all themselves, and they can step back and actually let the, the whole people of God lead and also then let the neighborhood lead. So um, I was just actually this this last weekend um, leading a final retreat with some clergy uh, working through this process. And um, one of them told a story about how his church um, had this space, you know, in their next to their building that they, had, you know, would figure out what to do with. And they ended up creating a dog park. So there's, you know, lots of apartments in the neighborhood and people didn't have a place to, for their dogs to, to, to play and, and run around. And, um, and in this particular clergy person is a great visionary and loves to come up with plans. And he, he had all kinds of ideas for how they were going to redo their buildings around the dog park and all this stuff. And through the process, what he realized was he needed to actually give space for the people of the congregation and also the people of the neighborhood to actually shape the future. And so, um, so stopping and kind of pulling back from that what ended up happening just you know in a very quick period of time was some neighbors actually stepping forward and saying well here's how we actually want to use this space mm -hmm. and then a foundation found out about it and they raised money to do this stuff like it all just happened you know kind of overnight and it was really I think the spirit leading from the outside in and it wasn't up to him to come up with the energy to come up with the plans and to come up with all the resources. And, you know, he was just laughing and saying, wow, this is this is a really freeing way to lead. So um, near the beginning of the book, um, you and your co-authors write, um, the, so the social and cultural shifts that are eroding established church structures are too big for any of us to reverse. Uh, trying to fix the church won't get us very far and will instead distract us from the deeper work at hand. Um, I understand that statement. It's hard for me to disagree with it. And yet when I read it, it just punches me in the gut. And I would imagine that probably a lot of other people have that same um, reaction as well. Because um, what it sounds like is that you're saying we're that we're at the point where we just need to abandon the, the ship <laughs> and then try to learn how to swim really fast. Um, and so I, I, I guess I, I'm kind of 
wondering, I mean, I, I know you're going to tell me that we cannot predict God's future, but I mean, do you think that the institutional church as we have known it is just going to fade away? Um, yeah, so, you know, in the book, we use a framework that, um, that you know, I, I'm really drawing here on Ted Smith's work and also Charles Taylor about a really major shift, cultural shift taking place you know, for really after the American Revolution up and through the 1960s, you know, we had this way of organizing church in America that was really around voluntary associations mm -hmm. that people found a lot of meaning in supporting and serving and building up. But starting in the late 60s, you know, we have the shift toward what Charles Taylor calls more on uh, ethics of authenticity or the age of authenticity. So we move from this age of voluntary associations to this age of authenticity where the meaning is found in discovering and expressing your true self. And that means often disembedding from institutions to do so. And so it, whereas at one point to work on, on an institutional congregation, serving on committees and all that was, was sacred work for some people, right? For generationally, that is less and less the case now with younger generations. And so there's a particular form of um, institutional Christianity that is eroding quite rapidly in American society that I don't think can be reversed easily. And it's I think it's in particular that sort of mid-size um, kind of program size congregation that has a dedicated building, a you know, professional mm -hmm. pastor and maybe a you know staff, couple staff people. Um, that relies on a lot of voluntary, you know, volunteer energy and committees and all that and programs to keep it going. That is just imploding. And it's not just in the mainline. The mainline is imploding most acutely, but also, of course, in many other denominations as well. So I think um, what we're seeing is the rise, certainly, of immigrant communities. And, you know, the Black church has always had a different narrative mm -hmm. and different way of embodying its life and has figured out from the beginning how not to rely upon necessarily professional full-time clergy and all of those things. Right. And so I think there's a lot of um, vitality in some of those communities and, and other models. And then I think the church is getting larger and smaller. And so we see, um, you know, mega churches that are thriving because they're not asking that of their people. They're not asking, hey, serve on a lot of committees and come fix the building. It's more, you know, speaking into everyday you know, things that keep everyday people up at night, you know, connecting faith to daily life. And then small groups that allow that to be, you know, to experience sort of tight community. We also, I think, are seeing a lot of small churches that are resilient, that don't have a lot of, you know, right. that structure. Or I think more and more in the future, it will be micro churches, whether it be things like fresh expressions of, of church, or whether it be um, networks of house churches, other forms of micro communities that are much more contextualized, if you will, for how and where people live today where again, the primary ask isn't support the institution. It's really more, I wanna help you um, discover authentic life and human flourishing and faith in a way that is um, that fits with that age of authenticity. And the age of authenticity is problematic on all kinds of theological grounds. I mean, um, and we could say a lot about that. I mean, I have all kinds of reservations at it, just as the age of association was yeah. often very hierarchical right. and. Right. You know, patriarchal and exclusive, right? So, so you know, the church, and before that, the state church, you know, which right. has its own problems too. So, you know, the church always evolves. Um, but I do think that the more we try to retrieve or extend the life of that voluntary association model of church in the age of authenticity, the, the, the returns are going to be diminishing because yeah. on a basic level, it can't be retrieved in most cases as it's often been inherited. Yeah, I mean, I think the vision toward the end of the book of a sort of a leaner, simpler, more organic church is, is you know, really, really appealing and hopeful in lots of ways. At the same time, I kind of wonder if, you know, the de in a deinstitutionalized church, um, you know, if every Christian community and every Christian leader sort of becomes a freelancer, you know, without the resources that all of us have had, the, who have had the benefit of being formed in the institutional church have, you know, things like um, resources to support faith development and credential leaders and theological education and cultivating a larger sense of mission. I, I mean, I know we just can't, you know, I'm, I'm not asking you to, to have a crystal ball, but... 
Well, I would say, I would say on that end that I think we will still have theological education. We will still have, um, we'll have local churches and those, the leaders of those local churches will need to be educated. It may not be professionalized theological mm -hmm. education. Right. Um, it, and I think the resources are going to be out there. And again, I think with technology today, they're going to be much more networked. People will find right. them and share them online and things like that. Um, and and I think accountability will need to be figured out. I mean, I, I am not an anti-institutionalist. I think there's a lot of ways in which institutions are, you know, are necessary for any movement to survive over generations. But the the model of the institution is gonna gonna look different. And honestly, I I think there's a lot about that that we we don't know yet. I think it's gonna have to be experimented with and and figured out. Um, we do talk in the book. A bit about um, you know a metaphor that we learned from the UK, which is about a mixed ecology of mm -hmm. inherited forms of church and fresh expressions or right. innovative forms of church coexisting. So I think we're in a bridge period where we really need that mixed ecology and where we can learn from both the experimental forms of church supported by the traditional forms and and vice versa, and that could really work together well to yeah. cultivate the learning that needs to take place. No, that is helpful. To, and, and it's not a black and white choice either, right? So so uh, to bring this to a close, um, if a congregation or an individual church leader, you know, sort of wanted to get on, started on this journey of faithful innovation in the way that you've outlined it, um, what are the first one or two steps that you'd recommend that they take? Yeah, well, so I would suggest um, certainly read the book because I think that would take you into the journey. Um, and then um, we actually have a, through Faith Lead at Luther Seminary, we've developed a kind of companion workbook that goes alongside this book that actually has the concrete practices mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that we talk about in the book. And um, it's called the Faithful Innovation Leader Companion, and that can be ordered on Amazon. Uh, you can also find it on faithlead.org. Um, and so those are resources to begin, begin that journey. Um, we also have, through Faith Lead, um, a variety of ways in which congregations can get equipped to take this journey and do that together uh, with other congregations. Um, and judicatory, like regional church systems, can also be trained to do this work in their own uh, systems. So, so that is all available at, at faithlead.org. And, um, and I think the, the key thing is to, um, you know, again, to, to start small and on the side, and to really focus on practices rather than programs. If our default is programs, um, that actually is less and less helpful right now. And what we're seeing as really transformational for many congregations is to introduce simple grassroots practices that anyone can lead. They don't require a clergy person. They're replicable. Um, they, they become um, kind of a part of the culture of a congregation in ways that begin to shift the, the focus toward a deeper spiritual connection with God, each other, and our neighbors. And um, not everyone expects that in many congregations. There are um, often people in congregations who honestly are there for other reasons, social, cultural reasons. Maybe it's the community service, you know, um, emphasis. And so when you invite them to do things like share spiritual stories uh, from their daily life or read scripture together in community, like in dwelling in the word, it can be a little, you know, hard for them. Um, but that's why it's important to start with those who are more open and those who are less open will eventually come along. Um, but what we found is that there's a lot of energy that gets unleashed when congregations take this journey, in part because we're really helping people make connections between their faith and their daily life. And if there's one thing churches need to do right now, it is that. It is to help people connect, you know, Christian faith, make Christian spiritual meaning out of what keeps them up at night. Um, what Scott Kermode talks about is, you know, their everyday longings and losses. And the churches that succeed in doing that are the ones that will thrive. And if churches aren't oriented around that, um, I don't see them actually being able to, to thrive in today's world. Mm -hmm.
Well, thank you for that, Dwight. Um, this is really a wonderfully accessible book, and I, I think it's going to be a great help to so many churches that are that are trying to find a way forward. So thank you to you and your colleagues for uh, this book that you've offered, as well as the wisdom that you've shared with me today. So thank you so much for being with us, Dwight. So great to be here. Thanks so much, Anne. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.